Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we are turning returning to War in the Pacific, Admiral's Edition, for multiple turns, uh, looking at my play-by-email game against Evoken. We have been playing for quite some time. I think the last episode I actually had out was, oh goodness, end of December on the YouTube channel? So it's been a while since I've posted anything. That being said, I have been making progress I have actually progressed six more turns in the game since last time. Uh, and so I've got a fair number of replays to show for you uh, to kind of catch you guys up. I didn't run any turns because, you know, in those turns, there wasn't anything groundbreaking or earth shattering, if you will, uh, that I really wanted to show you. I do have something coming up that I did want to talk to you guys about in this episode. Um, but you know, it's a, it's a fair amount of, uh, of stuff that happened to just, you know, no craziness, right? Um, still looking on the optimized configs to get this game running on windows 10. I run it on windows 10 just fine, Zart. Um, I do use the CBs utility, which basically helps modify like the resolution for this game. So if you are interested in getting war in the Pacific running, I recommend you check out the uh, forums over on matrixgames.com um, and search for CBs. It's uh, basically it's just an exec file that will edit the actual War in the Pacific exec so that it'll run at 1080p or full screen or whatever without any weird graphical glitches and stuff like that. And it runs totally fine. So I uh, definitely recommend you check that out. It's a free download and it's, it's, it's a nice little thing. I, I don't think you could really play it on a modern system either without that or without manually editing the resolution stuff within the uh within the exec which i've done before myself something just sank by the way i just i heard i heard oceans go over the top of something by the way guys let me know if my voice is too quiet with the the bombing here those lines are pretty close to each other i can adjust if necessary If anybody wants to throw a link in the chat for the CB's sort of forum thread, feel free. Otherwise, um, maybe I'll look for it after the turn. Pretty quiet turn so far. A couple of submarines fired some torpedoes. A couple of ASW um, attacks. Some bombing. You know, the typical right now. It does feel like Evoken is probably in the process of sort of re reforming his... Uh, his forces i guess i mean he's been in charge for a little while now i think what like is it two game two weeks in game maybe a little bit more um but i do know that you know based on what the previous opponent said uh there was a lot to do for japan so you know it it, it makes sense that it took some time i am curious where the japanese carriers are we have not had a lick of a sighting in them in well over two, uh, two weeks ish i think was the last time we saw anything um, it was actually before Evoken took over, we we spotted some around Singapore. I'm also very curious when the Japanese are going to make a serious thrust for the Philippines, uh, because so far it's just bombardment attacks there. We're into June, and we still have basically the entire Luzon garrison holed up it at Clark Field, um, awaiting the Japanese crushing counteroffensive. These poor boys are starving, trying to live off the land, and uh, the Japanese just won't finish them off. How many have the the Japanese have not lost any carriers to my knowledge? Uh, we did damage one with a torpedo. I think we actually put two torpedoes into one, but we don't think we sank it. We don't have any claims that we sank it. We do know we sank one Japanese battleship. Um, too many aircraft assigned to the Lexington. Okay. We do know that we had um, one battleship that was sunk, uh, but we we and we have damaged another. Um, but I don't believe we sank any carriers. We put a big Dutch torpedo and the smaller size Dutch torpedo into it. Um, but that's, that's about it. So let's go ahead and jump in and look at this turn before we jump back out and look at the replays here. I'm curious about Lexington here because actually something interesting happened. We've got Lexington in port and Saratoga. They're both at 30 days, which I feel like they were not just a day ago so what i am wondering i have this upgrade set to yes we did an upgrade i think for april or june or may not that long ago and i thought we were like six days away from that upgrade being completed 
but I wonder if there was a June upgrade for this ship, and I don't know how you can see that, because, I mean, this says upgrade one of three, but this is the October upgrade, and I know for a fact that's not the first upgrade available for the ship. I wonder if it doesn't show you... If it doesn't show you the actual previous upgrades that have already been done. Because it's now saying that's stuck in South Africa for 30 days, which was never the intent. It was supposed to be 20 days, and it was already like a week plus into that. And now we're right back out to 30 days. So I kind of think maybe the Lexington and Saratoga were in the process of doing a refit, and then they got a second refit while they were in there doing the first refit. And now, so, like, they should be a lot better when they get out, but now they're not going to get out till July. It's going to be July before we actually have to, uh, um, you know, come back here, which kind of sucks, frankly. Uh, meanwhile, also one other thing just worth calling out at the start of this, we've got the Prince of Wales currently moving at full speed to the United Kingdom. I am risking the flotation damage. It's at 39, which is tied to the major. Anytime you move at full speed, it could risk accelerated flooding, but I'm doing that because mission speed is like two months and I don't want to wait two months. So I'll take the, I'll take the gamble that we can get there more quickly. Um, additionally, we did have some submarines near Meaden. We had the tuna that was sort of being depth charged here. We know there's cruisers and transports and Meaden is a major oil facility here. So we're trying to get, get that all sort of put together. Rangoon sitting with 75,000 supplies. Burma's in pretty good shape supply-wise. 15,000 down at Mulman, 5,000 at Pegu. Um, and then we're trying to sort of bring in additional supplies into this region because I'm fully anticipating at some point the Japanese are going to make a drive into Burma and you cannot bring supplies over the mountains easily. It's very inefficient. So your troops will starve in a major campaign. And so I'm trying to put as many supplies into Burma as possible before, you know, before we actually see any major combat there. Um, and that's all I want to show you right now. We're going to jump back to the main menu. Does this quit the whole game or just the... No, good. Okay, we're going to jump back to the main menu. And I have another replay to show you guys. So that was the first replay of the day. We have another replay coming. I'm just going to go ahead and switch the save files over. And we will look at the June 2nd replay in one moment. And thank you, by the way, Big Bang, for the resub. Really appreciate the support. Okay, so we're now on to the June 2nd replay. Should I dox myself and say that's my birthday? Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. Who knows? Anyway, we're on to the June 2nd replay here. And Zart, thank you for the sub. Appreciate the support as we move into the second day of June 1942. No sign of a midway operation yet. Um, so we're not quite as aggressive uh, as, uh, as perhaps the Americans were. But the Japanese haven't been as aggressive either. I mean, they were in the sense that they advanced into the South Pacific much more aggressively but they did not advance into the Central Pacific anywhere near as aggressively. Meanwhile, we are depth charging a Japanese submarine to the southwest of Australia. We have convoys going back and forth between South Africa and Perth. We're trying to make our main supply hub into Australia be Perth rather than the long west coast to east coast supply route between the US and Australia. Um, I don't know if that's the most efficient route, but with having lost New Caledonia and sort of our strategic line of communications having to divert way south closer to New Zealand, um, it does seem like it's the more efficient route uh, and perhaps the safer route. It isn't totally efficient to transport supplies over the rails from Perth to the east coast in Australia, but it seems like we're doing it. Um, so, so, yeah. Zart? Yeah, CB something. That sounds from that sounds about right. I do plan on taking retaking Nomaya the Big Bang. I don't know when yet. Um, I do feel like we are getting to the point where maybe we could start thinking about a counteroffensive, like a more serious counteroffensive. Uh, we haven't, you know, it's hard, right? Because the Japanese still have their entire carrier force. So, what's the right thing to do? <laughs> like. Do you try and bait them into a midway? Because if the Japanese are cautious and hold their carriers back, 
you know, the major risk there is that then we've got to expose our own carriers to land-based air as well as the Japanese carriers. And with the Japanese having Bettys and Nels, that's a lot more dangerous for us to do than J the Japanese to do. Um, so, you know, if we try and go on an offensive like at New Caledonia, we're going to be under land-based air either out of Spirito Santos, out of New Caledonia itself. And also, if the Japanese decide to deploy their carriers, then we'll be dealing with that. It doesn't feel like a terribly advantageous situation to be in. Um, we could possibly help out by bringing in long-range land-based aircraft to provide some additional cap over the carrier groups. Um, the P-38 might be able to get you close enough to the carriers for a cap mission to like still have the carriers be in range of the island, but we don't have very many of those. So, do you have any tips for the Gary Grigsby games? You were gifted War in the West, but you're used to Hearts of Iron 4. Well, patience. I don't know. I haven't really played War in the West. Um, I think the newer games are better about not being quite as micro-y. Like, all Gary Grigsby games are micro-y, but they're a little better about not being as micro-y as, like, War in the Pacific. Um, but, yeah, I would agree with Finnish. Hearts of Iron and, and War in the West are kind of, like, two completely different ball games in terms of the type of game they are, the the pace that you're going to play at. You know, the, the only recommendation I would really have is take your time. Don't hesitate to consult with the manual. If, you have, if you're not sure what's going on, that is normal. I'm still not sure what's going on half the time in this game. Um, but, uh, but take your time and don't be afraid to fail. I think that's one of the nice things, you know, if you're playing, you can play as the Germans and fail and that's what you're supposed to do, right? Um, or you can play as the, as the Americans and you've at least, or the Western allies, and you've at least got a buffer, right? Like they're strong enough that you can make mistakes and still be pretty much fine. Um, the game for the Germans is not about winning. The game for the Germans is about surviving longer than historical. Um, the winning conditions are not like hearts of iron. The winning conditions are Germany takes over the world or whatever. Right. Um, in, in war in the West, it's not that it's like do better than history. That's, that's like the condition. Anyway, um, so we just did the June 2nd turn. Uh, you can see here, Did I think if we look at the carriers, they're going to be, what, 28, 28 days now? Yeah, so they're, they're in that upgrade path. If we look at the Prince of Wales, which we have been going flank speed, she didn't pick up any flooding, and she did progress one day, so down to 17 days. The other nice thing is, remember, it was what 54 days before now it's 51 so it seems like flank speed cuts three days off the cruise speed so three days for every one um so even if we had, had some flooding damage and had to switch back over to cruise we're, we're saving it's more than a one-to-one -one, right every day we get at flank speed we save three days on cruise so that's that's definitely nice about it um if we go ahead and we take a look at the south pacific here we are in the process of dropping off or sort of shifting troops around. So we've got the second Marine regiment. These guys are going to go to Australia to form the second Marine division. Um, some of the elements of the second Marine regiment are already on transports here. The plan is going to get the second Marine division to Melbourne, where we're going to form them up in a single unit so that we can prepare them for offensive operations. And so that's where we're at right now. But you can see if we go to the second Marine regiment and we go back to the second division, all of these units with the exception of a small amount of the second Marine regiment and the full eighth Marine regiment, all of the other units in the division are already on transports on their way to Melbourne. So we're going to need to load the eighth Marine regiment up soon, as well as what's left of the second Marine at Vavu uh, to get them over there. Now Vavu should be fine. We've already dropped the 9th Marine Regiment here to replace them. So the 9th is replacing the 2nd, so that we still have a full regiment of Marines here as a defensive force. We also have the 147th separate, which is kind of like a light infantry regiment. It doesn't have a lot of heavy equipment. You can see here the heaviest thing it's got is some 105 millimeter howitzers, but no tanks or anything like that. Um, it's a light unit. It's an independent unit, but it's good for defending his position, especially if you've got fortifications. And then at Savi... We're currently still unloading the 58th Independent Infantry Regiment, 
which is going to replace the 8th Marines. The 8th Marines were there by themselves. They took the island back from the Japanese. They'll be replaced by the 58th Infantry Regiment, uh, and then we'll get everybody at Melbourne and form that division up. Um, meanwhile, I don't know if we talked about this or not, but we did land uh, a small force, the Kanga Base Force Battalion at Vadavupu, and we took that back from the Japanese. Just a small pinprick, basically. As you recall, the Japanese pushed south, took Funafuti, took Canton Island. At one point, they had taken Baker Island. So they had pushed a good deal. I mean, these islands never fell to the Japanese historically, as far as I'm aware. Um, and so we're taking back some of these from the Japanese. They're not heavily garrisoned. So that's another thing to consider is like these islands are not places that we need to be super worried about. These aren't real counteroffensives. We're not doing huge bombardments. They're largely unoccupied, but in the case of uh, Vatavupu, it has a level one port, so we can unload some stuff. We can It's an atoll, but we can try and build up a small airfield there to exert some pressure. At the very least, we can bring some float planes into Vatavupu so we can get some recon going, probably as far north as Tarawa, Ocean Island, as far west as uh, Nidini or maybe even Esprit de Santos if we get some Catalinas in here. Um, and then same's true for Baker. Baker is a little bit of a better situation. We retook this one a while ago, but it has a level one airfield. Now it doesn't have a port. It doesn't even have like the option to overstack and build a port. But in theory, if we build this airfield up to a two or three or whatever the max is, even though the natural size of the island is a zero size airfield, you can overstack it a bit. And so if we put in like a two or a three and we get a couple of twin engine aircraft there, they can do some recon. We'll probably won't be flying B-17s out of there. So we won't be able to do any major bombing on Tarawa. But again, we can exert our influence and do some recon, um, you know, around this area. Yeah, just kind of swapping the flag bloody. But frankly, that's how a lot of the islands were taken by the Japanese. A lot of these South Pacific islands, historically, like up in this area, they would land like a small marine contingent, like a platoon or a company, and they would claim it was Japanese. Like most of these islands were not major bases, especially when Japan took them. Um, and especially even like after that, where, where there weren't major campaigns going, a lot of them were fairly small. Um, trying to think I don't, if there's anything else to show this turn before we do the next replay. I don't think so. We did have that depth charging of that Japanese submarine. I do have some ships that are unloading some supplies at Albany on the southern southwestern tip of Australia. So I mentioned that Perth is sort of my ideal main port for entry into Australia from the west. It's already a level six port, so it can hold up to 84,000 tons of shipping at the dock. Um, we do have shipping coming in. We've got 44,000 fuel coming in. I've been primarily pumping fuel into Australia because I have not been doing much naval stuff around Australia. So that fuel is not being consumed by ships. But then that fuel, based on the industry here, like if we look at Perth, Perth has 40 heavy industry, 160 light industry. That industry will convert fuel into supplies. And so we're in a pretty damn good spot in Australia. Like we've got a million supply units at Sydney almost, 964,000. Australia produces some of its own resources, so it does produce some some of its own supplies. But if you cram enough fuel into Australia, it will generate a ton of supply so that you will never have to ship supply to Australia as long as you keep pumping in enough fuel. Um, so that's, that's definitely something to consider. Um, but yeah, we've got, we've got a number of convoys going back and forth. And then Albany is also sort of, because we've had a lot of Japanese shipping sitting on the port, or a lot of Japanese submarines sitting on the route to Perth, I've also been in the process of expanding the port at Albany. So it's a level three port. It can take up to 24,000 tons at the docks, 12,000 size ship limit, I believe. Um, or maybe that's dock versus waste, waste uh, in terms of efficiency unloading. I'm not sure. But I do plan to expand Albany a little bit up to maybe a five or a six as well. So Perth and Albany can both act as major hubs because they're both on this railway. So it should feed supplies east. Again, I've heard or I've read in the forums like there's a limit to how far supplies will travel by rail. But I don't know if that's true because we put like 400,000 fuel into Perth and that's all gone. And it didn't it didn't rot. It didn't sort of that wasn't wastage. There's no maximum amount of supply at Perth there's you know smaller bases you'll have you'll have spoilage if the base is too small for the amount of supply there but Perth is a large enough base that essentially it has unlimited supply that you can pack in there 
And, you know, we haven't seen where that 400,000 plus fuel went. So I do think it's been pulled east. And, and again, with the amount of supply that's at Sydney, the indication to me is that that fuel was pulled east along these, these railways and it has been, you know, converted in these factories to supply. I am also trying to bring additional supplies into Darwin. So you can see we've got some light transports here at Darwin. Um, and we're trying, we've got plenty of fuel there. But Darwin is kind of the northern coast of Australia is a little bit unique in that the west coast at Perth and Geraldton and Albany all are connected by rail. You've got this high speed rail and road network between Kalugabula and Port Augusta. Um, and then that goes all the way to the East Coast, which is also all linked by these sort of high speed transit, you know, l good road, good rail networks. That's what these little hash marks represent. Um, so all of this area is very well connected. However, when you try to go up to the northern coast, if you go past Cluncurry, this rail line basically ends here. You can see this is the end of the rail line and it's got kind of a small small road these are coastal roads or rural roads not major highways from clone curry all the way up toward catherine at catherine it changes to a railway between catherine and darwin but but effectively this whole northern coast broom derby windham darwin these ports all are connected only to the east coast via a very small roadway and so supplies moving north do not move very efficiently uh and so that's why like we've got a million supply at sydney while we've got this red exclamation point at catherine indicating catherine doesn't have sufficient supplies it's got a thousand out of three thousand requested so that's why that's also why you can't rapidly move reinforcements to darwin and so we've we've sort of been a little bit more proactive and moved a good number of units nothing huge but a decent number of units about a division well maybe two brigades worth of of uh, troops and equipment on the north coast near Darwin in case the Japanese decide to land anywhere. By the way, Zara, thank you very much for the gift sub uh, to Bloody Falcon. And Stein, thank you very much for your sub as well. Uh, I really appreciate the support, guys. Trying to stream more regularly, trying to be worthy of, of support. Um, otherwise, we've still got the tuna chilling here at Meaden. It looks like she fired off four torpedoes last, actually six torpedoes last turn. So you've got the uh, the SS Tuna um, firing off some some cans, some some Mark 14s, not really hitting anything, but doing some stuff there off the off Meaden, which is a major oil producing facility, it produces 200 oil and has a 200 size refinery um, per turn. We also continue to unload more supplies into Rangoon. We've got 82,000 supplies there right now, plus another 23,000 in this cargo task force here, unloading. Um, and then we've got another 2,300 still about to, or in the process of unloading over here. So really trying to pack in supplies in Burma and no real changes that I can identify in China. So not a lot going on there. With that being said, we do have more turns to show. So we will talk through some more stuff on this uh, stream still. I'm not going to go over every little thing on each replay, but we do have another replay to show you guys. So let's go ahead and let's do that. One second, please. So we have done two replays today. We got a third coming here. Um, that was the turn. That was June 2nd, right? So now we're going to do June 3rd. So here we go. It was the June 2nd replay, June 3rd order. So now we're going to do the June 3rd replay and the June 4th orders. All right. So here we are once again off to the next turn. And as a reminder, we're playing play by email. So effectively, the way this works is like I'm showing you multiple replays. These are turns I have already passed back to Evoken. He has passed back to me. So this is the old school way to play, right? Play by email. Save a file on your computer when you hit end turn email the file to the other person. The other person puts the file in their game. When they open the game, when you play as Japan, when you open the file, it generates the replay. You see the replay, issue your orders, send the file back to me and the replay back to me. I view your replay, but the game is smart. It has sort of a fog of war mechanic where the replay that the Japanese player and that the American player see is slightly different 
based on what information they would have available to them as the player. So Japan sometimes gets fog of war and sometimes, you know, Japan will see a battleship getting torpedoed when the Americans know actually that's a tanker um, or a carrier getting torpedoed when actually it's a tanker. Um, that can happen. Um, or you'll see, you know, different reports in terms of number of aircraft shot down or other things like that. Um, it's all, you know, it's very cleverly done for a game that is frankly as, as sort of old in its bones as it really is. Um, okay, so PBY is doing some recount over Canton. We can see the Japanese continue to bomb Coast Coast Islands. We've got two battalions of pretty good Jap or uh, Australian troops there um, that are in range of these these bombers. And I, I did put them there mainly in the hope that it would prevent the Japanese just deciding, hey, we're going to land an SNLF company here and just take the island over without, without any real effort. Um, that kind of concerned me a little bit. I didn't want to give them that island because if they got that island and they put Betty's or Nell's, the supply line between Australia and, and India would get kind of hairy. We'd have to like move all the way to the edge of the map. It would slow things down dramatically between India and Australia. So I kept those trips at Coast Coast to kind of keep the Japanese air power further east. Uh, as a result, however, they're on an island that we can't effectively defend. All they're going to be able to do is prevent an easy landing. If the Japanese commit like a regiment of troops there, the Japanese will take that island. It's just a matter of making the Japanese make that commitment, right? Like, do they really want to spend the effort to put a regiment sort of out in the middle of nowhere? Do they value it that much? Or, you know, that regiment is probably going to be better used in Burma soon. Um, so that's sort of my logic. But they've got plenty of small SNLF or Naval Guard units. You know, they may not, may not care to deploy something there but those those units by themselves probably not strong enough to take out two battalions of australian troops speaking of australian troops let's take a look at that because if you remember you know when this game started the vast majority of the australian troops were militia units and so we need to take a look at that because i don't know if the vast majority of our australian troops are militia troops anymore they may have upgraded to 1942 equipped troops and they may be regular infantry now which would be a huge increase to their combat efficiency and would also make landing on uh, Australia much more difficult. So let's go ahead, go in here. Take a look at the replay, or we already did the replay. Um, but let's go ahead and take a look at the Australian troops. If we go to Perth, what do we have here? Nothing too big. We've got a battalion of engineers, some base forces. We've got two battalions of infantry. These guys are AAF Infantry Section 42. I don't remember which units were which, but these are basically regular infantry. AIF Infantry Section 2, 42 means 1942 equipped infantry, regular infantry, not militia, good quality troops, uh, which is nice. So Perth does has a, have a couple of units there that are equipped like that. I don't think there's a battalion here. These guys are still militia. So these are CMF, which I'm assuming means Commonwealth Militia um, at Geraldton. So those are kind of the, the crappy ones that you've got plenty of squads for. The, the challenge with the Australians early in the war is they do not have very many regular infantry units to draw from. So if we actually go in here and we take a look at the um, reinforcement, where is it? Infantry, inf industry and infantry pools. So if we go ahead and we take a look at the, the pools here and you scroll through here, you can see this is a list of all the equipment that units draw from heavy industry, support, engineers, all that jazz. Uh, but if we actually just filter out all the nationalities and look at only Australian stuff, um, you can see here that they have, they've got 160 Matilda II tanks. I think those are Commonwealth equipment, but that's, that's a pretty good chunk. So you can see here CMF infantry, Commonwealth infantry. There's 46 of them in the pool. Those aren't the militia though. Um, where did the militia just go away? We've got 71 AIF Infantry Section 42s, we have used 1,972 of those. We are producing 55 of those a month, so that's basically two a, two a turn. Um, but I don't know whatever happened to the militia. I don't know if the militia just went away and they're not recruiting them anymore. CMF Section Militia, so we've got, we've used 89 of them. We haven't returned any of them, so that's interesting. And then the AIF Infantry Section, just the standard ones. Um, but yeah, I wonder if these guys shut down or something in any event, it's certainly taken, taken a good chunk of, of that. 
The majority of regular units would have been in Africa. Funny you say that, bloody. Um, Yes, when the war breaks out in the Pacific, they were. The majority of Australia's good troops were in Africa. They did have militia units that stayed behind. And so if we actually go here, uh, wrong wrong city, that's the the one American division in Australia. Uh, But if we go to Toowoomba, you can see here the 1st Motor Brigade AAF section. These guys were militia troops when it started off. It's basically a motorized unit with some some sort of mechanized support. Um, the 3rd Motor was also militia. Uh, but then the 4th Australian Division, uh, it was actually... No, this was a native division to Australia, so they were never in North Africa. But these guys were originally militia. They have completely replaced their militia units with 256 regular infantry squads. So these guys have been trained up to the quality of a regular unit. Experience is 40, so they haven't been deployed to combat to Africa, but they they are, you know, they are now a regular unit. Uh, we'd have to spend a bunch of political points, so it would require a thousand political points to take these guys off this Australia Command headquarter. You can see the R next to it. What that basically means is these guys can move, I can move them anywhere in Australia, but if I try and put them on a ship to sail them somewhere else, I can't do that because they're a restricted headquarter. They can't leave their headquarter unless they have permission to do so. And they only get permission if I use political influence to convince the Australian politicians, no, 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 Australia is safe. We can use those troops somewhere else. And don't worry, we'll take care of them. That's me using political influence. That's what political points represent. And you gain more of those over time or as you destroy things or sink things. Um, actually, I don't think destroying or sinking things, but you basically you get a certain amount of it over time um, that can be spent on things. Now, speaking of North Africa, the 6th Australian Division was in North Africa. So this was a unit that was reinforced to us maybe a month and a half ago. So basically after Pearl Harbor, maybe it was two months ago, after Pearl Harbor, the Australians said, oh, fuck. Japan is coming. We're freaking out. We might get invaded. All we have is a bunch of militia divisions here. We want our troops back, Churchill. And Churchill was like, "No, no, you're fine. Don't worry about it. We're not you're you're fine." Well, at the end of the day, they brought two divisions back from North Africa, and the 6th division was one of those divisions. And you can tell that um one, if you look in a history book, Two, if you see the headquarters is actually not restricted, it's a sign of the first Australian Corps, which means I can deploy it anywhere outside Australia that I want. Um, And three, they have a level 72 experience. So these guys are crack troops. Level 72 experience, like 40 is like trained. That's like guys came out of boot camp. They're reasonable quality troops, but they don't have a ton of experience. 72 is crack. Those guys are elite troops. Some of the best that we've got. If you look at the Americal Division, which is um, actually got its name from de- being deployed to New Caledonia, it's kind of where the Cal came from. That hasn't happened in this game, but you can see this American Division here is a forty-one. They are not crack. They are they are a very good unit in terms of the quality of the unit and the troops, but they haven't fought. They haven't done anything yet, and so these guys don't have a lot of experience. I think the U.S. Marines have a better experience level. Um, generally speaking. So if we go here and we take a look at the 9th Marines, you can see they got a 70 experience level. Now they haven't been fighting in the desert. I guess this is just supposed to be like, hey, the Marines are good. Um, But yeah. Uh, Meanwhile, another division for Australia, which upgraded was the first, there's our New Zealand brigade, but the first Australian division here, these guys have also upgraded. These were all militia before, so we've got them broken out into three segments, but the first Australian brigade also has upgraded. So that makes the Fiji line or what's left of it much stronger. So we've got, you know, um, an Australian brigade and an American infantry regiment and some artillery at Fiji uh, or Suva. We've got um, an Australian division and an Australian brigade, the seventh brigade um, at Navi. So the island of, uh, of, of Suva here has like two divisions worth of troops effectively uh, compared to like what the crack Japanese divisions would be worth. Um, in terms of anything else, did the tuna fire any more torpedoes? Uh, did she, no, she's just still, still chilling with 18 uh, still unloading our stuff in Rangoon and Burma. No sign of any changes in China. We did bombard the troops there to see what they've got. Basically they've got like, 
a division worth of troops here. I don't have enough to overthrow them yet, but you can see we are shifting troops around in China. Um, how's my pilot training looking? I don't really know what I'm doing for pilot training, to be honest. I mean, I've got pilots that are training. I don't know. I don't know. If it's, I don't know if it's working, but like we've got a, a huge training element here in Calcutta and in India. We've got a Marine section flying wildcats, 70 wildcats with pilots that are training here. You can see that these guys are, they're gaining experience in my training setup right now. So they're gaining, uh, what is a strafing experience and then also defensive flying experience and just their experience stats are going up. I think we need to change their mission to like escort or something or maybe cap to get their air skill to go up as well. But we do have pilot training ongoing. We do have a little bit of a, a, a little bit of a pool of pilots that we can pull from. So if we go to pilot replacements and we look at the reserve pool, this is another like if you're saying how detailed is this game? Look at these are all individually named pilots. Thousands of them. So yeah, there's this is this is a, there's a lot here. Uh but if we were to go to the reserve pilot pool and we were just to say like, "Hey, let's look at the US uh US Army. We've got 920 pilots in the pool. Most of them aren't great, but we do have we are building up a, a cadre of reserve pilots here for when we take casualties." Um so you can see here like Ellis we're at 76, 76, 75, 74. Like we've got, I mean, this is a good number of pilot. My, and I don't know what the, what the rule of thumb is, but my general rule of thumb is if you're over 60, you could be pulled in. I try to get folks closer to 70, but if you're over 60 in most of your traits, and if your experience levels around 60, you're a pretty damn good pilot to be like a reserve pilot. So like we've got, I don't know, 50 or a hundred pilots that have over, over 60 experience. So that's decent. Um, thank you, Sultan. I, we've So we've got our, our current training set to, and you can see the total numbers here. So this is not my training programs, but we've got 3,400 U.S. Navy pilots who are in the very beginning stage of pilot training off the map. They've had what less than one to three months of instruction. We've got 3,300 that are four to six months into their training and their experience is up to eight. We've got 1,700 that are at seven to nine months into training. Their experience is 12. And we've got 1,600 pilots that are 10 to 12. Their experience level is 20. And then they kind of usually enter in the pool around 39 to 40. Uh, but you really want to get them up closer to 60 to 70 before they're engaging in combat. Most of the Japanese elite pilots are going to be 70 plus. So, you know, that all factors into how they perform. And you can see different countries have different average experience levels in their pool. You can see the replacement rate per month of pilots. I believe that's the per month rate. Um, for different branches so this this game is nuts um but yeah so we've got we've got a bunch of pilot training going on calcutta we've got pilot training uh going on back like in the u.s here you can see there's a bunch of uh a bunch of pilots here back on like p36 mohawks p40b warhawks um that are that are set up on on training programs here uh flying at 100 feet uh, flying sweep missions, I believe sweeps improve defense, and then escort improves air. I think, uh, but you can see here we are we are working on training some of these guys. This one's not a very good training outfit. I might need to add like a commander with a better experience total because I think you usually want a high experience commander in there to 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 help help bring folks along. Um, but yeah, you can see a lot of different different units training. P3043 Lancers, huh? Is the P43 just a P47 with like weaker guns? But in any event. So we've got pilots training. Um meanwhile, blah blah blah. blah. Is there anything else we want to show before we do that? I've got another replay to show you, so maybe we just jump into the next replay because we're already almost 40 minutes in. Um Rangoon sitting at 72,000 supply. Still got the 18,000. Some of that supply is getting sucked out elsewhere. It also doesn't have the turbo supercharger that the P47 has. Good to know. All right, so let's do another turn. We got we got another replay in us. So that one was June 3rd. So this one's going to be June 4th for the replay. And Away we go.
Okay, away we go on the June 4th replay. So many turns, so little time, but also not a ton of stuff going on on the turns. At least so far. Hey, look, a hit but no explosion. There's your Mark 14 bullshit. USS Sailfish off the coast of Japan, operating in the Sea of Japan, just hit a merchant ship with a torpedo. And the torpedo didn't blow up assholes i really can't wait for that mark 14 to get fucking fixed we're still like a year away from it though so it's gonna be a good long while meanwhile the tuna operating off the coast of meden sad mark 14 face bloody falcon we have do we still have that mark 14 emote with the circle and the x through it temporary repairs flailing on a dutch submarine apparently near rabal i didn't catch that previously there's nothing wrong with the torpedoes. It is purely an air skill issue. Okay, Buord. Sultan, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to try you for war profiteering. Alright. Um we do have that emote. Thanks, Newhauser. Alright. Um I also I did remix like I think I made some of the emotes available to anyone who's just a follower, so like certain usually you know, certain emotes you gotta be a sub for, but I did, I did try to give more emotes to folks who are just followers. Alright, meanwhile, the bombing continuing in the Philippines. So that's all ongoing. Did you really just tell me to finish my turn, Hauser? What do you think I'm doing? Gosh. Um, all right. So quiet ish turn. I guess we'll fast forward here a little bit. The Thresher. Tuna firing torpedoes on Japanese destroyers in shallow waters. That is maybe not what I would advise you to do. And, uh, yeah, so those depth charges are apparently penetrating and doing a great deal of damage to the tuna. Usually Japanese depth charging, not terribly effective, and I don't get too worried, but a lot of internal explosions. I think she's on the surface now because of bad damage, and now they're hitting her with gunfire. So we are probably going to lose our first sub in a good long while, all because tuna decided I'm going to fire torpedoes at a destroyer in shallow waters. And 13 hits and sunk bastard I don't know if Lieutenant Commander Bell is any good I don't remember what his stats are but he certainly wasn't lacking for aggression uh, so not only did we get a dud a hit but no explosion but we also had a submarine loss to stupidity that's a good turn <laughs> uh All right, bombardment going on in China still. Canberra, we got a few bases expanding fortifications and airfields. I think that's probably about it. I don't think we have any other, I don't think anything else will happen here. So we'll just let this turn play through and then, you know, honestly, I'd say let's just jump to the next turn because i have one more turn T december 41 all over again what do you mean see still hanging on to the philippines god damn right we are we're gonna be in the second week of june and we're still gonna or close to the second week of june and we're still not gonna have lost so that was the fourth right 30 okay so let's go ahead and we'll do one more replay real quick and then we'll jump back into the turn and kind of wrap things up. So we'll do the, the 5th of June, which is my last replay that I have on hand. And then there are a couple of things I want to show you guys. Actually, I might have one more turn now that I think about it. 
have to double check. But um, anyway, so onto the June 5th turn. Still no sign of the Japanese having any interest in attacking uh, the troops on Luzon. So at least theoretically, you know what would be interesting? No, this is the last turn. Um, you know what would be interesting is if the game gave you bonus victory points for holding on to the Philippines, like longer than historically, right? You know, I, I don't know how much that would how much that would matter, but in terms of, hey, you know, you're doing a really good job here. Compare, you're doing even a better job than historically happened. Like it hasn't fallen. That would maybe put a little more pressure on the Japanese player to actually take the island because it is very possible as the Japanese to just isolate them, leave them, let them starve and move your divisions out elsewhere to keep your momentum moving. I don't imagine in real life the Japanese would leave just two divisions behind to guard them. Like that would be too big of a risk that they'd get counterattacked and overrun. Um, but that is a that is a common way for folks to play to free up a lot of the Japanese forces once you kind of get them bottled up uh, to move on. Meanwhile, those Japanese uh, ASW uh, ships now are sort of attacking or we're trying to attack a dutch sub to the east of meden um so that's lame so they sank a sub last turn and are still on the attack this turn by the way greg paladin paladin thank you for the follow and board engineer thank you for the follow all right so more bombardment going on on the philippines as we would expect and some Japanese recon over Rangoon. That's kind of to be expected as well. Uh, yeah, just kind of, just kind of chilling, just kind of waiting to see what happens here. Didn't look like too much naval action this turn, but as usual, a fair bit of recon and stuff for air stuff. Fairly quiet though. No air attacks. And right into the bombardment of Clark Field, where the Japanese 16th and 33rd Division, as well as the 11th J Japanese Army Air Force uh, base force, is just keeping us bottled up and bombarding our troops who have no supplies left. Looks like one Japanese division, the 32nd, is south of Quilin. I was debating trying to throw them back to get them off our doorstep. Um, they're the fact that they can choose which of two cities they want to attack in the south is a little bit of a problem for me the flip side of that is it doesn't matter that much because they have one division there so like they would need to move in reinforcements and it's bad roadway more difficult for supply so um we'll at least have some warning before they uh before they drive either right or left but that should be it for the june 5th replay we'll take a look at the june 6th turn which is the current turn uh, before we before we wrap up I've already issued a few turn orders on this one this is my current turn that I need to send back to Evoken soon first things first let's check in on the Prince of Wales she's moving at full speed I did slow her down for a day or two to just because she did have some flooding her non-major flooding increased to like 42 but back down to 39 after slowing her down so she's back at full speed 15 days away 44 days on the cruising speed so as you remember when this stream started it had said it was 54 days to england if we were going at normal speed we've gone we've cut that down by a full 10 days um over what four replays so we're making progress there 15 more days on flank but even in without flank uh it's uh, it's it's coming along she's she's getting there she will repair more quickly in the united kingdom which is why we're sending her there but it was kind of a dicey situation of like, do we just leave her in Colombo because she was already repairing there? And sort of the the assessment that was done was if we can get her to England, it'll be at worst a wash in terms of time. It won't be slower. Uh, but if we can get her there faster by doing flank speed stuff, then it might actually be a big advantage. Like we might save 200 days in repair time or, or whatnot, um, or not 200, but maybe 100 days, maybe like three, four months. Meanwhile, Lexington and Saratoga still 25 days out on their refit, which is just nuts. They're going to be out of action until June. Uh, we have also brought in the, I believe it was the Enterprise. We brought another carrier to South Africa. Yep. Enterprise is in South Africa. Yorktown is still in India. Um, but one other thing, like, so there's no more shipping at Meaden. 
We haven't seen any sign of Japanese air cover around here. We know they do have some air cover in Rangoon, 66 fighters. No indication of bombers there. I would imagine he's got, well, we know he's got bombers at Palembang because he periodically bombs Coast Coast Islands. So we know he's got Nels and Bettys there. Meaden is 15 hexes away. What is that? What's the uh, from Palembang? So if we take a look at the Japanese aircraft here, I think the Nell has longer range than the Betty. So the Nell can carry torpedoes out to 21 hexes. Jesus Christ. So if he's got torpedoes at Palembang, he can torpedo anything out to the Sabang area, like out toward here. We don't have any shipping in that rate in, in reach of that. But it does kind of close off the Strait of Malacca to us. And then if he's got anything at Singapore that pushes things even further out to like Great Nicobar, we have seen no sign of anything at Singapore, but it would be logical for him to have some stuff there. Still all pretty close to the fringe of that range. Um, and also the weather's been bad there, so like no sign of no detection for a lot of these things up here because they can't. They can't see. It's light cloud and clear sky in the Strait of Malacca. They can base them at Bangkok, but our intel says they're not there. So our, our, our reconnaissance flights over Bangkok, you know, if they were to base them at Bangkok, then yeah, it would be even closer range. They'd shut the whole Andaman Sea off. They could definitely prevent me from bringing cargo ships into Rangoon. They have merely not chosen to do that yet. Um, you can see here, Intel says 66 fighters and three bombers. I don't know if he's afraid of us launching a bomber offensive against Bangkok. Remember, we do have some P-38s at, at Bangkok, which could fly fighter sweeps over Bangkok to clear the air, and then we could bomb the base. So that might be a reason not to, uh, not to have a ton of bombers there, but I mean, we don't have any bombers there either, so. So I think he's mostly just a little bit a little bit nervous that we might bomb Bangkok. By the way, this is our best fighter unit in the game. We only get it for another month, little less than a month. But you can see here, look at the experience on these guys. <laughs> you got Pappy Boynton sitting here with 84 experience. I don't know what this guy's name is, B.D. Wagner. I'm going to call him Bobby Wagner, 83 experience. Roquan Smith here, 81 experience. Uh... Yeah, a lot of a lot of good good uh good good gentlemen here. So, bunch of aces here too. So you can see their kill counts. This is I mean, these are the this is the flying tigers. We just gave them P38s instead of P40s because we had enough to do it. And then we've got one other P38 squadron that is currently sort of equipping the P38, so they haven't fully equipped here, but we've got um, P-38s up here just out of uh, out of Burma in Chittagong in India. So we're equipping 25 of these or 27 of the uh, 25 of these. This is not a super special squadron. It's a good squadron. We've got a, several pilots here in the 70s and then we've got guys who are basically training down here in the f almost 50s. But we got, you know, seven, eight really good pilots here in this group. So we've got all told about 50 P-38s which is not going to be producing much longer. Um, the P thirty eight E was not only had like two. I want to say they had like two hundred units in the P thirty eight E that were produced all told, and then um, so I think there were like two hundred and some odd P thirty eight E's manufactured all total and a chunk of those went to Europe, I think. And like a hundred went to the Pacific or something. Um, and then it switches to more modern versions of the P 38 P 38s later. But if we go to the aircraft replacement pool here and we go to fighters, if we, let's see here, what's pool we go to the total here. We have, Why can I not see where they are? P-38E. So you can see the P-38E produces... Actually, the production on this has already stopped, so it's red. The P-38 stops uh, at the end of May of 42. So you basically get like 
a month or two months of production here plus some P-38Es that were previously in training units on the West Coast that we pulled out of training units to put in frontline units. Um, and so we have used 11 of the 24 that were made, plus the stuff we pulled off the coast. So we've got 13 replacement aircraft here. So if we get into a high-intensity conflict, those P-38s are going to run out pretty quick. But they are very good aircraft, better than anything else in the map right now. And then I think we get the next version of the P-38 soon. Uh, so we get the P-38, is it the F? We get the P-38F in August. I think we get like 40 of those, and the production on that also doesn't last very long. And then the P-38G comes in October, and I think that's when production really kind of starts at like 20 a month. For an extended period of time until you get into 43 when the h comes online and then the j and then the l as you get through the war now the p51 we don't have any p51s yet but they are in the game you can see p51 d comes online in i guess november of 44 um you've got the p51 b which comes online in march of 44 these dates are later than the production started but i believe europe was prioritized with the p51 models so you get some p51 a's in july or september of uh of 43 but these dates are definitely later than what you saw in in europe they had p51 d's in like what was it february or march in europe um a 44 and b's before that but yeah, so not sure there's a lot else to show. I kind of showed you a bunch of stuff in between turns. We're still in I mean, we've got more cargo ships unloading supplies at Rangoon. Rangoon supply is good. The troops in uh, at Clark Field are starving to death. Oh, that's Batan. Clark Field is starving to death. Hey, look at all the units with no supply. They're going to evaporate into nothing, to a puddle of death. They're probably going to start evaporating already, although we still have about 1,500 assault value for the moment. But once the Japanese decide to start attacking, that's going to fall apart real quick. Yeah, the Corsair is in the game too, Seatown. I mean, every every major and even minor aircraft model is in the game. Um, so we will get Corsairs eventually. We do not have them yet. It is only June of 42. So um, our pools are, I mean, we, as we were showing there, aircraft replacement pools right now, We've got a lot of P-40s. We've got 100, or we've got 94 P-40s in reserve, 62 P-39 Aero Cobras, 53 Australian Kitty Hawks, the version, their, their P-40s. Uh, we've got 47 F-4F F4 Wild, F4 F4 Wildcats and 24 F-4F3 F4 Wildcats. So a good chunk of, uh, of a lot of different stuff. Um. All right, guys, uh, with that being said, I think this is as good of a spot as any to wrap things up. Um, the live stream ended a couple of minutes after this, but uh, yeah, we've been going for almost an hour. This was, what, four, five more replays? Um, so we're making progress. It's not like we're progressing anywhere near a real-time amount, but we are making progress. We're into June of 42. The tide should begin to turn if we actually can lure the enemy into doing anything, but that'll be for another time until next time. This is the historical gamer. Once again, saying thank you very much for watching and until next time I'm out.